There's a story about a man who walked into a local restaurant and introduced himself to the fellow sitting at the next table, and the man said, I guess you've probably heard of me. My name has been in the news recently. And the second man said, no, I'm sorry, who, who are you? And the first man puffed out his chest proudly and said, I'm the winner of the world's most gullible man competition. And the second man said, wow, I've never met a world champion before. How did it feel to win? And the first man said, the best day of my life. But recently, I lost the title. And the second man said, really? When? And the first man smiled slowly and said, just now. <laughs> Our sermon series this summer is called the clickbait gospel and this morning I want to share a few thoughts with you about how this contemporary media phenomenon relates to our Christian faith today. Some of you may know that clickbait is an internet term. Clickbait refers to a written headline usually with a sensational or provocative title and frequently accompanied by a provocative photograph or other graphic image, and even sometimes has an audio soundbite. Both the text and the photograph are designed to capture the viewer's attention, a sort of visual and audio teaser. And the purpose of the teaser is to entice the, or bait the viewer to click on the provocative headline or photograph and then to read the accompanying message. The defining characteristic of clickbait is to intentionally deceive the viewer with a sensational, semi-accurate, semi-truthful statement, but on further investigation, the viewer learns that the message is false and misleading. Did you ever wonder what people might have thought about the headlines of Jesus' day? Of course, in those days, they did not have the internet or radio or television or mobile phones or even newspapers. Nearly all the communication was done verbally. But what did they think when they heard stories with headlines like three mysterious kings from the east follow a nighttime, sky, uh, nighttime star and, and visit a miracle child born to peasants in Bethlehem? Or the headline, Nazarene Walks on Water in Galilee. Or even the headline, Jesus of Nazareth Claims to be the Son of God. And then you hear the story that Jesus is betrayed by a friend. He's arrested and put on trial by the government. He's beaten and tortured and finally punished for his so-called crimes. With a sentence of death by crucifixion, one of the most horrible forms of death ever created. And then even more preposterous, even more incredible, you hear that three days after Jesus has died and is buried in a cave, a cave whose entrance is blocked by an enormous stone rolled in front of the opening, a cave whose entrance is guarded by soldiers, yet three days after he's buried, you hear that Jesus has risen from the dead, the stone has been removed, the tomb is empty, and Jesus has appeared to his friends and others in various places. One of those friends, of course, is the disciple Thomas, otherwise known as Doubting Thomas, because he did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. That is, Thomas did not believe in it until he saw with his own eyes the holes in Jesus' hands and feet, from being nailed to the cross, and until Thomas touched with his own hands the puncture wound made in Jesus' side from the spear of a Roman soldier. Then and only then did Jesus believe. And then Jesus said to Thomas and to the rest of the disciples, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. There was a very famous magician named Richard Potash. Ricky Jay, as he was known, was considered the most legendary sleight of hand artist 
and magician. In fact, he's considered the best of all time. And Ricky said the ideal audience for his magic would be a group of Nobel Peace Prize winners and Nobel Prize winners in other disciplines because, he said, they often have an ego that says, I am really so smart that I cannot be fooled by anything. But according to Ricky, smart people are the easiest to fool of all people. Did Thomas refuse to believe the other disciples when they told him that they had seen the risen Christ because Thomas thought the disciples were gullible? Or was Thomas afraid of being seen as gullible himself? Did Thomas think he was the smartest person in the room? Or was Thomas afraid to trust something that was too good to be true? Is that also why some of us have trouble believing in the resurrection of Jesus? In the scripture reading this morning, St. Paul repeats the message Jesus gave to his disciples at that moment. When Paul writes to the congregation at Corinth, he encourages them to live by faith, not by sight. And as Mary Sue just sh shared with us, Paul reminds us to live a new life in Christ, not bound by the limitations of the past, but empowered by Christ to be ambassadors of reconciliation. Now, some of you may be familiar with the television show, America's Got Talent. It's a weekly talent show featuring celebrity judges who evaluate a variety of performers from singers to dancers to comedians and others. And the performers uh, compete in weekly auditions and the final winner of the competition receives a $1 million prize. A recent episode of this show featured a singer and songwriter named Jane. Some of you may have seen this program. And Jane was interviewed by the judges before her performance and, and when asked, she, she offered that she was 30 years old, a native of Zanesville, Ohio, and a singer and songwriter, and that she was there at the edition all by herself. Jane told the judges that she would sing an original song that she had written called It's Okay. Then one judge asked her if she sings for a living and she answered, not recently. She explained that she is a three-time cancer survivor and that she is still battling cancer today. Her song, It's Okay, is about her struggles with cancer. Jane said she called her song, It's Okay, because she refused to be defined by the bad things that had happened to her in her young life. Frankly, I'm grateful for the doubting Thomases of the world. Doubt is one of the most important tools that God uses to create women and men of faith. In fact, I worry about someone who says, I've never doubted for one moment my faith in God. Because I think to myself, my friend, are you alive? Do you have a brain? <laughs> Do you use it? Do you not see and hear and feel the pain and the suffering and the misery that is all around you? Doesn't the poverty and hunger and homelessness and crime all around us bother you? Do you think the headlines of the senseless shootings every single day in Chicago, just a few miles from here, are simply clickbait headlines designed to deceive and mislead us? Does the daily suffering and continuing deaths from the COVID virus both here and around the world not make you wonder? Do you think it's not true? Does the daily suffering and daily deaths from cancer and other diseases make you at least doubt your faith at times? St. Paul reminds us that we must live by faith and not by sight. And for Thomas, seeing is believing. And so it is for many of us. And yet, seeing and not believing is the truth for many of us as well. 
Are we afraid? Are we afraid to trust something that is too good to be true? Has our doubt or our cynicism or our intelligence allowed us to ignore and even reject the truth? Are we able to see but not believe? Or are we not able to see and yet believe? Jesus says to the doubting Thomas, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And St. Paul reminds us to walk by faith, not by sight. The scripture reading today also calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. This means we are called by Christ to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, not just those we want to love. And in this spirit of love and reconciliation, God is calling us to do something about the suffering and misery that surrounds us. God is calling us to love our neighbors by helping our neighbors. And so many of you have answered this call. So many of you are devoting your time and your talent and your treasure to helping others. You are serving in soup kitchens to feed the hungry. You are serving in groups like PADS to help the homeless. You're serving in groups like Rotary to vaccinate the world's children from polio and eradicate this disease forever. You're supporting the work of organizations like the Community House and the Wellness House and Circle Urban and the life-affirming work of so many other wonderful groups too numerous to mention here. And we thank you all for your service. Now, many of you are serving on our church's signature mission project to open an all-day preschool in Summit, Illinois. And we know the value of preschool education. We've been doing it here at Union Church since 1957. The evidence shows that children who had the benefit of a quality preschool education go farther in school, get better jobs, get more promotions at work, and otherwise do better in life. And you may not know, but a significant percentage of the young girls in the freshman class at underserved communities like Summit are pregnant. This means they do not complete high school. They're not able to get a high school education or to get better jobs or to have a better life, at least financially. And their children don't get a preschool education because they cannot afford it. And so the cycle of poverty continues on and on, generation after generation. But an all-day preschool would allow these mothers to complete their high school education or work during the day to support the family and to have a better life, not just for themselves, but for generations to come. So let us continue to respond to the call to serve others in any way we can, in Jesus' name. Now, if you did not see the end of America's Got Talent show featuring Jane's, here's what really happened. Jane sang her song, It's Okay. The music was beautiful. The lyrics were very meaningful and moving. Jane said she did not want to be remembered for her illness. She acknowledged she had a slim chance of uh, survival, but Jane had hope. Jane said, I am so much more than the bad things that happened to me. Instead, she wanted her song to be a message of hope and encouragement and happiness, a message of reconciliation, a message of belief in the future, a message of love. Part of the lyrics of Jane's song are, and I quote, it's okay if you're lost. I don't look back at all. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore to be happy. Jane's radiant smile and glowing presence, her beautiful voice and her inspirational song and her story of courage wowed the judges and the stage audience. And when she finished her song, the judges were completely silent.
One of the judges, Simon Cowell, who was not particularly known for his sensitivity, told Jane that she was very, very good. But Simon said there were many other wonderful singers in the competition and that he could not give her a yes to send her to the next round of, audi of auditions. He said to Jane, instead, I'm going to give you this. And he stood up from his chair and he pushed the golden buzzer on the table, which meant that Jane was not rejected, but instead she would be going straight to the finals of the competition. And as glittering gold confetti showered down on Jane from the ceiling in celebration, Jane fell to the floor of the stage, weeping uncontrollably in gratitude. There was not a dry eye among the judges and the studio audience. And I'm sure tears streamed down the faces of millions of television viewers, including mine. And if you check the internet, the clickbait headline for Jane is, Cancer Patient with Six Months to Live Wins America's Got Talent. That clickbait headline is true. And Jane's story is true. And the gospel according to St. Paul is true. We are called to live by faith, not by sight. For we can all learn from people like Jane that with suffering comes hope, and with hope comes love, because Jesus loves us. And with love comes happiness, because Jesus wants us to be happy. And with happiness comes faith, because whoever believes shall have eternal life. Seeing is believing, and not seeing is also believing. By the grace of God, let us walk by faith and not by sight. And by the grace of God, let us be ambassadors of hope and of love and of reconciliation in a broken world. Amen.